Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Joe Swimmer. I'm the Executive Director of Episcopal Parish Network, and um, we are pleased to be partnering with Episcopal Communicators today to present this session on We Have a Problem um, related to communications, of course. Um, it is wonderful to have uh, you all joining us as attendees and our expert panel here with us today. Um, almost 350 people signed up to join us, and uh, that is terrific way to start off the year. It's also a terrific way to head into EPN's annual conference, which is coming up March uh, 6th through 9th in Houston, Texas. If you want more of what you're about to hear, if you want to hear about communications from our friends at Episcopal Communicators, here's some wonderful keynote conversations, including celebrating our presiding bishop and his uh, historic primacy and um, dealing with white supremacy and um, lay leader Saturday. We want you to join us in Houston. We hope that uh, you will take uh, time to look at the agenda and if you're available to make it down to uh, Houston, the Western Galleria. Um, there's more information about that that will be put into the chat. Um, otherwise, again, thank you, Episcopal Communicators, for partnering with us on this. Thank you all for joining us. And without any further ado, off to Alan. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, and as the chair of Episcopal Communicators Board, uh, really grateful uh, for the Episcopal Parish Network's willingness to, to continue this partnership and offering this program today. Um, I'm the Church Relations Officer for the Episcopal Church's Office of Government and Relations. Um, and as uh, chair of Episcopal Communicators, I uh, just want to do a brief uh, sort of plug for that. Um, we're, uh, in case you're unfamiliar with us, uh, we're a member-led organization of people in the Ministry of Communications uh, within the Episcopal Church uh, and offer a number of resources on professional development, uh, talking about standards of church communication, uh, and really help to develop fellowship among folks in that ministry to try to improve uh, our efforts to engage our, our own congregations, but the broader public as well. Um, so really excited about our topic today uh, accordingly. Um, just a brief um, plug echoing some of what you said, um, Joe, uh, as a uh, membership organization, um, if you're not already a member of Episcopal Communicators and think that would be uh, useful for you, I'll put the membership link in the chat. Um, but there are also two chances to see us in person. Uh, for, one is in our own uh, Episcopal Communicators Conference in April. Uh, that will be in Portland, Maine. But before that, we'll be doing the pre-conference for communicators at the Episcopal Parish Network Conference in Houston. Um, some really cool programming for that with uh, with folks in the um, marketing space, the church space, uh, political space, bringing in some really creative uh, storytelling ideas. Um, so our hopes for the webinar today is really to convince church leaders uh, who are not professional communicators to invest in good communications. Uh, it's critical to, I think, the, the success and future of the Episcopal Church, uh, and it's going to look different uh, in different contexts. It might look like investing in staff uh, or investing in the resources that staff can use. Uh, it all, may also look like being intentional you know, as a smaller church, if you're a rector leading one or, or a lay leader leading a, a congregation, you know, to build communications capacity as a part of your, your role and to really understand that. Um, and of course, anything in between. Um, so it's not only a financial matter, though it can be, um, it's also about uh, inclusion of communications capacity within our church programming. So we're gonna hear from three uh, amazing contexts uh, from around the church today. Really grateful to our panelists, uh, Bobby and Merrick, Andy and Nandra, just super grateful for your time today. And, uh, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Merrick, to get started for our first segment here. Hey, thank you very much. It's good to be with all of you. My name is Merrick Sabrisky. I'm the rector of Christ Church here in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. I've been here five years. Uh, the hiring of our director of communications is probably the most important hire I've made and perhaps the best, you know, hire I've ever made. Uh, we had someone who was gifted in this position who have brought in a lot of credentials. And when we lost that person, um, there's concern with how could we match up with someone. We, we were able to get someone actually with stronger skills. And the things I would just mention to people are it is perhaps the most important hire you can make today. Because prior to uh, bringing on our, our director of communications, Bobby Eggers, every time we launched any kind of new initiative, it was kind of a roll of the dice. It might work, it might not. And a lot of that is if the director of communications didn't think it was a good idea or suggestion, just could not market that. And the person had great professional experience, but did not 
uh, come from a background in uh, church communications and did not even attend a church on a regular basis. So it's a bit like getting someone to market Whole Foods for you who never market, you know, shopped in uh, Whole Foods or perhaps even in a grocery store. They might have all sorts of edgy, creative things, but they don't actually believe in the product itself. So I, I can't, you know, say enough about trying to hire someone who's outstanding at this. And I would go the route local if you could. We brought in a finalist, uh, ha having put together a search committee and even worked with a uh, professional headhunting firm their number one choice they uh, introduced me to, I took this person to lunch and I watched this person almost try to consume an entire frisee salad in one bite. And I just thought to myself, actually, the social skills of this person would be a challenge um, at times. And they looked like they were, you know, basically much more comfortable uh, behind a computer screen than with people. And we really needed someone who could interact well with people. I believe that's vital for communications. So I ended up, I uh, was able to convince Bobby to join our staff. She's lived in Greenwich for like 25 years, working in, in the field of marketing and communications and advertising, and knew just about everyone uh, who's who in Greenwich. And it would take someone else coming in here like 25 years to get up to speed with where she was on the first day. She also was a member of our parish and knew the parish extremely well and the kind of ethos of what makes Christ Church tick. She's also a believer, as I am uh, very much in, in printed communications. We have all sorts of uh, wonderful printed communications with full of photographs and uh, things. And why this is so valuable is I find a number of people say, including our, our former director of communications, you know, the day of print communications is over. I think that's absolutely wrong. Uh, when people get this, it's a celebration of all our ministries. It makes it very easy for them to go through dates and put things on their calendar. They end up sharing and talking about this with others. Uh, their friends end up saying, I wish my church had this. So we hear this all the time through Greenwich that uh, the volume of programming we're having and how you know attractive we make it becomes very desirable for others. And it has a big stewardship impact because people can say, that's the breadth and depth of what you're offering our church and our community. And I really want to get behind that. So again, I would just uh, heartily commend this as perhaps the most important hire on your staff. I think the rector should get you know very involved in this. I had a background in journalism and wanted to be involved in it, but it's going to be the ex a direct extension of your ministry and everyone's ministry on your staff. And I just say in closing, before I turn it over to Bobby, our uh, program uh, growth has just picked up hugely after this. Our worship attendance has gone up hugely. We're now at numbers well beyond what they were prior to the, the uh, pandemic. And it means that every staff member can, can be free and every lay leader to be creative about programming, knowing that it's very likely we'll get a good attendance to almost anything we do at this point because of the level of marketing and communicating. Bobby, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Uh, one of the most important things it, that works is that Merrick and I are in lockstep. Uh, we both agree on the strategy. We both agree on the goals. So I work with him and work with the staff. I'm involved in most of the meetings, many of the meetings. I don't go to vestry meetings, but the rest uh, I'm, I'm in very involved with. So it's really important that you have a strategy and that you have a brand. You're not the church down the street. You're not someone else's. You are you. We have a very concise brand that we put together. Um, also, it's important that you look at the entire calendar of what's going on in the church. Uh, I will show you in just a second what the way that I do it. Um, we also have to not speak in church speak. People don't listen, they don't understand it anymore. We even have trouble with people with the word pledging because they don't understand it. So Merrick, can you speak to that for just a second? Sure, you know, the average person walking in here is now Roman Catholic. I'd say about half of our parish is, and they have this idea vaguely or like a dream that the, the diocese is funding the church rather than vice versa. So we have to get kind of to the macro level of, uh, or micro level of just engaging them. We have a very simple welcome card. This you know includes a couple of boxes you can check off. One says, I'd like to join Christ Church Greenwich. 
that gets checked off in like half of all the cards we receive. And we receive a couple of cards every uh, Sunday. And, uh, you know, when we follow up in that conversation, you know, when people are ready to join, we have that conversation now immediately about going ahead and pledging and supporting the church. We, we make it clear that it's not mandatory, but we do encourage everyone to support the ministry and mission. And that's been uh, very effective uh, with stewardship and helping people I also offer to have coffee and conversation with them as do all of our clergy. It's a way of really getting to know them individually right off the bat and everything we're doing is about building community that's the other big thing i would share that if you focus on building community there's a great chance that your worship tenants your music your pastoral care your adult special formation and outreach will all prosper if you don't get the community community piece together these things will all probably struggle to reach their potential and at the heart of the community building is communicating effectively uh for some of our young families, we have a generation that understands that they do a monthly subscription to Netflix, but they don't understand that they have to do a monthly prescription to the church. So this, that is a challenge. Alan, can you go to the next? So this is my wall. <laughs> this is part of it. I have the entire year. It's This is particularly messy. I've got to clean this one up. But my entire wall in my office has this these calendar pages and it really helps it's old school but it really helps people as they come into my office they want to schedule and it helps staff and volunteers parishioners to understand how busy we are to understand that scheduling is dancing on the head of a pin between the red lines that you see here are the school vacations um the holidays and then when you really get down to it there may be two or three options for any any given um event alan the other thing that works for us in a big way is that i do not use stock photos i know most churches do i have we just redesigned i just redesigned the website and uh, I did a lot of research and most churches use stock photos. I don't like them. I don't think they work. I think authenticity is key. It's key to all ages now. And so we use nothing. We I take a lot of videos. We have volunteers who love to take photographs. Um, some of them are very talented. I use these all the time in everything we do. I'm redesigning the main hallway with photographs. People love to see themselves. They love to see their friends. And there's also a vibrancy. There's an energy to it that, that people, it's, it's attractive. We look positive. We look happy. We look, um, and yet with the branding, we still look important. We pride ourselves in being a faith leader in the community. And I always want to present us as such. Alan? Okay, so here's some of the tools that we use. The most important thing and what a lot of church people don't want to hear, but it's all about the phone. That's what people read on. I schedule all of our newsletters on Thursday morning at 5.30 in the morning, Sunday morning, 5 30 in the morning i say good morning because the first thing people do when they wake up is they roll over and they turn on their phone and i want to be the first thing there for them to and we have extraordinary opens it's amazing how many people read our newsletter merrick likes a joke because so many people in sweden read <laughs> i don't know why sweden um we have so this these three slices that you see our um, excerpts from our newsletter. This is what a typical newsletter looks like. I post the sermons. Um, we post the forums. You can see the second one down. Those You click on them and you go to YouTube and you can see the forum from the previous week. We have a women's conference coming up that is um, 250 women on our campus. They spend the entire day. They go from event to event. It's all scheduled. We serve them breakfast and lunch. It's pretty fabulous. And we're advertising that right now in our newsletter. You can see our forums. But the first thing at the top of the newsletter is worship with us today and all the <clears throat> schedule of what's happening that day. Um, I do press releases. They work. 
like crazy. Wait, Alan, go back one, please. Uh, press releases work like gangbusters. It's free advertising. And I have a list on Excel that has 72 different news platforms, including some TV. TV usually only comes out for packathons. Um, but it we get it's it's funny what uh, the news will pick up some things not others, but I highly recommend that you use them. Then use a template, create a template, and then you just plug in that paragraph uh, with that event. Uh, obviously, we're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, we also find oddly enough, Patch. You know, you think people don't read it, but they read Patch. Next door, a lot of young people look at Eventbrite, especially if they're in town or they're traveling. What do they want to see what's going on in the community? Uh, we do podcasts. We have a volunteer who uh, is fantastic. Andrew Boyer does. Uh, we record after we do a forum, we record podcasts. Uh, Reverend Cheryl McFadden has a woman's series, series called uh, Women Walking in Faith. And then Merrick runs a podcast series called The Calling. And we talk about, he interviews people about their calling in life. Uh, those are available on Spotify. It's very easy. I set them up on Podbean and we post them on Spotify and um, Audible. We do live streams. We do it through, we don't use Facebook because we don't have the technology for that. We do it through our website um, and it seems to be, be fine. It's a local, the company is called Local Live and they, they do a fine job. For the forums, we have two cameras. One is locked on the PowerPoint monitor and the other one is locked on uh, Merrick interviewing the, um, the person who's doing the forum. We also have school newsletters. We, we send flyers out, especially for children. And uh, anybody who rents the space here in particular, we have Greenwich Suzuki Academy. And, and they send our, our flyers out to um, their parents. So it just it's just a lot. You know, there's an old saying about, I think it's nine contacts. Uh, it just takes a lot. You have, to, you have to put the pedal to the metal, as they say. Alan? Yeah, these, uh, these tools are like wonderful, Bobby, in terms of, you know, different things that require investment of, you know, time. Um, platform investment, you know, and all having having particular impacts. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll keep moving along and um, go through the the rest of your slides here. Thanks. This is uh, branding. Although we have very different type of events, like you see Messy Church on the bottom, but they still all feel the same. So that when you are scrolling through Instagram or whatever you're on, the Christ Church stuff feels like Christchurch. It's very important to me. I, I have a background in branding. So um, it, 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 I just find it doesn't work by using a lot of people use Canva and they pick up these templates and one will have green with leaves and, you know, for something. And then it'll, the next thing is a completely different look. It, it doesn't help you. It doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't also doesn't um, instill who you are and who you represent to your audience. Okay, Alan. So Merrick was talking about social. After we came out of the pandemic, Merrick started with a, a parishioner, Nancy Thody. He started a, uh, a group to do social events together. We call them friend raisers, not fundraisers. The deal is that they have to break even. We can't lose money on this. It can't cost us anything. So the budget, we 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 do the budget first, and then we decide whether the tickets are $25 or $30, $50. We've never really gone over $75. They work like crazy. These it, they're they're really fun. People enjoy them. And and Merrick really believes, and Merrick can speak to this if you want, but he really believes that if you can get people there, see familiar faces, maybe they'll come into a worship service and they'll see Joe from the gatherings event a month ago. Or familiarity is really important um, to building the church. Now, uh, just add, if I may just add to that, that the largest pandemic they say affecting our country and our world is loneliness and isolation. And if we can help conquer that and address that in our community, it's huge among teenagers. 
um, if we do nothing else, we've done something remarkable. And, and I think that's where the people's craving is today. The Episcopal Church has a wonderful way of going into every con, uh, kind of a hotly debated topic of its day. And it has a great way of dividing our congregation or shrinking it. But if you focus on community building, you can address all sorts of topics and things over time that are vital, but you'll have a vibrant congregation be part of it. But people are, there are so many people that are lonely and isolated. We're trying to do our very best to overcome that. Alan? Yep. And yeah, go ahead. Here are two of the gathering events that have been really uh, special and the uh, we've, Last year we did this and we were repeating it again this year. It's just coming up. And this comedy night with a uh, epic ta taco bar, as you can see, we had 240 guests. It was very casual. It was, I think the tickets were $35. Jane Condon, uh, who you can see there in the picture in the um, purple jacket, is a nationally known comedian. She happens to live in Greenwich. She's a very dear friend of mine. And then she kind of produces the show. She brings in a clean comic. Obviously, we can only hire clean comics. Not an easy thing to find in this day and age, especially around New York City. So she manages that for us. And, and they're fantastic. People just have the best time, as you can see. On the right side of this page, you'll see The Calling. This is a storytelling night that is hosted by Bonnie Levison of the Moth fame, some of you may know The Moth on, on NPR. Bonnie is spectacular. She hosts this. She works with six parishioners for two, in like two phone calls two weeks before, and she curates their stories. So it's not a brag fest. Someone's not going to come up and tell you that they were on the cover of Time Magazine or whatever. She works with them to find a nugget of a story, a special, a pivotal moment in their life, and she's actually going to be at EPN. She is doing the communications workshop, which is going to be an afternoon and a morning. And she is going to do the same for us. And I, I promise you it's spectacular. And I promise you, you should sign up for this <laughs> because it's hard to describe, but when you're there and she does a story slam with these people, they, you know, they tell a little story of five minutes. It's really fantastic. People cry people laugh. It, it It's great. I've done many of these with her and they're really special. Okay, Alan. Thanks for that plug, Bobby. I'm really looking forward to that uh, in March. We started a messy church here. That, uh, we didn't, um, American. Cheryl started this. Uh, it is, it's blown up. This is so successful. It is a service unto itself. I know many of you have had experience with Messy Church, but this one it really is enthusiastic. It's energetic. Uh, young families come. We promote it for young families with wiggly kids. They they know exactly what to expect just by the name. The name itself is fantastic. Uh, one side of the room, when it's indoors in the in, in inclement weather, one side of the room has supervised crafts while the parents and the older kids can sit on the other side of the room and listen to the service. The kids do get intertwined in there. Every Sunday is a different theme. This Sunday is Jonah and the Whale. Um, and again, I, we rethink the donating language for this crowd because they, they just don't understand pledging. They don't understand the importance of pledging. Merrick, you want to say anything about Messy? Well, it's great. You know, it, the name conveys what it's about. And, um, you know, people say we're struggling to get young families and things to join us. I think the spiritual craving is never going to go away, period. Uh, so if you meet people where they're at, you know, what time it meets, if you say it's going to be at uh, Saturday night at seven o'clock, you're not going to get them. Um, but we do it at nine o'clock in the morning. It's, it's, in a very decent time frame in terms of how long it is and it's really geared so the children love it and the parents want to be part of it and they get fed spiritually as well because the homily is really kind of designed for the parents while the children are doing something and they can overhear kind of what's going on they join in for the music and they uh close with a wonderful song where they all join together and everyone receives the eucharist together so it's a great formula cheryl's done a fantastic job leading this along with uh susie mcniff our, our deacon the, you can see on the left side of this page, that's a page. We still do printed uh, orders of service. 
that's the inside cover of one of the messy orders of service. It it gives parents, this is based on a Harvard study that just came out. It gives parents the understanding of why it's important to bring their kids to church. They, so many of them don't want their wiggly kids in the more formal services. So, but they still have, they want to raise their kids with values. They want, so I try and help them understand in any way that I can, why they need to bring children here. Um, and it's also very important, uh, you can see on my list, uh, the grandparents want these kids here. So if you can connect with the grandparents as well and talk to them, explain to them about Messy Church, so many of them will say, oh, I have to tell my daughter about that. She has to bring her kids. And they do, or there's a lot of grandparents bring their kids on their own. And it allow obviously allows for a, a Sunday morning breakfast for the parents. Okay, Alan? Yeah, and you've got a couple more tools, and then we'll um, we'll turn to our next speaker, Bobby. Okay, so we we do a membership planner. This is pages out of this planner. It is um, this is the new one. It's a printed piece, and it shows the calendar of all the upcoming. Yeah, it's old school. Yes, it's expensive to do, but it's an amazing piece. It gets a lot of attention. I, in my industry, I call it a PR piece, but it's. People uh, don't throw it away, they save it and they schedule their uh, week accordingly. Alan, you can go to the next page. And we just redid the website. You can you can see it, this is just a little piece of, it's very branded. Um, I, I did it on Square, excuse me, Squarespace on purpose. I like Squarespace and Wix because they're very easy to train people on. Your staff can use it. It's just click and drag. It's 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 not complicated at all. So um, it's very easy to flip out photographs and it's important to have a video on your header. Uh, again, authentic photos only. That It's a make or break. Um, if anybody has any questions, I am here. I would love to help you. I, I, I'm not saying that this is right for everybody. It just is working for us. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you both. And uh, I do want to draw one question in um, that I've seen in the chat, a couple of versions of it before turning to Andy. Um, but mainly just want to hear from Merrick and or Bobby, what is the how do you operate as a staff in terms of where the creativity lies? How well do you incorporate, you know, Bobby's sort of communication expertise into the into staff meeting, into the operations of the church? I'm wondering if you could just speak to that briefly. Well, we all meet together in one staff meeting every Tuesday morning and go around the room and each person has a chance to share whatever they think is a benefit for the whole group. Um, but Bobby and her uh, part-time assistant, uh, Lyle, are there to be kind of like the megaphone for any of our ministries. So people can say, you know, we're rolling out this. The, the main thing is you want to be able to clarify what is that exactly is this concert about? What makes it special? Or uh, what is the focus of this Bible study and who who's the target audience? And a lot of that has to go on in separate conversations and all. But, um, you know, their gifts are available to our whole staff. So it empowers everyone in that room uh, as well as lay people. We had a, a program this week on uh, the theology of um, Howard Thurman. And, you know, we had a snowstorm. And, and so they were able to switch it to make it over Zoom instead of in person. But it, that was all lay led. And it was um, beautifully supported, which made it possible. So we had, it wasn't a huge turnout. It was like 14 people participated. But if um, they didn't have an adequate support, there might have been two or three people showing up. So it makes a lot of but difference. Just to add to what Merrick is saying from a communications point of view, everything has to go through me. It all the branding, all the events, all the stuff, I have to, I have to lay eyes on it because there is a certain tonality. Otherwise you get it just is kind of, you know, a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate y'all's uh, this example uh, from your church in in Greenwich. And I want to turn to Andy, um, is it All Saints in Atlanta? Um, thank you for being with us and and would love to hear from you. Uh, describe a bit of what your context is like in your parish. Um, how do how do you fit in as a communications professional there? Uh, what does the congregation look like? Um, sort of what are the successes that have come from from uh, good incorporation of communications? Sure. 
Thank you so much, Alan, um, and also Joe for the invitation. I'm very excited to be here and also to hear the veterans in this kind of role. Uh, great hearing from you, Bobby, about some of the things that are working in your context in Greenwich. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll provide a bit of introduction. Uh, my name is Andy Dixon. I'm communication, the communication staff of one in our context here in Atlanta. Um, our parish is located in Midtown Atlanta. Um, we're kind of one of the oldest landmarks on our landscape here. Um, been around 100 years, um, and our parish is quite robust, very active, um, 3,000 plus strong in terms of um, membership. And I would say that um, so, um, as someone who has a communications background, um, some different contexts, um, it came as an academic. I'm finalizing my PhD moment now, and um, was really excited about the opportunity to um, engage on a daily basis the question: of How do we message the folks in our community? Um, as someone at the time, so this was very interesting um, for me as a challenge to town. I have never before done church work, um, having never before kind of done the daily grind of trying to message unity. And that was an exciting challenge for me, something I'm keen to take on. Um, and I'd say this last year has been extraordinary for me um, in terms of basic learning all of described and, to you. And, I Andy, I'm going to I'm gonna jump in. Sorry, just uh, your audio is breaking up just a little bit. So we're struggling to hear you. Oh, I, I apologize. Um, I, I don't know I'm wondering. I don't know if you need to adjust your where you're sitting, or if that will make, uh, if that will help or not. We can also this, give it a rest, and I can turn to Nandra and come back. Either way. I'm not sure. We were doing okay during. So. We were. It, 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 we just lose a couple of words here and there. To do, I'll take your lead on that, Alan. Okay, all right. I want to turn to Nandra. Let's give Zoom a rest. Sometimes it will do that, and then I'll come back to you, Andy, because I want to keep uh, hearing from you about the context in Atlanta. Um, so, Nandra, I think you'll um, you'll be coming in here with some perspective that you've probably seen pop up in the chat um, around uh, what smaller churches um, can do and how churches with part-time clergy or just one staff person, you know, in numerous situations, what this might look like in their context. Um, so I know your work with Iona Collaborative is, is very much, uh, is very familiar uh, with that uh, that reality in the church. So I'll, I'll turn it to you to, to explore what you've learned, what you've seen as a success. Uh, in terms of invest, investing in communications uh, in that environment. Right. Absolutely. Um, my context um, to start just I could not could not be more different in, in certain ways. Um, by day, I am the director of the Iona Collaborative at Seminary of the Southwest, which is um, a resourcing body for the formation and ongoing support of people who do ministry in small church settings. And all the time, I am a, myself a country vicar um, of St. Philip's Episcopal Church in Hearn. Um, our ASA last year was 18 people, and we're really proud of that. That actually represents stupendous growth from about five years ago. Um, different as my context is, I'd say my core message is really the same, um, which is that um, community building is the key to everything, I think, in our life in the church and communications is an important part of community building. And authenticity um, is also, um, we have also found that to be key. And in fact, our, our very small setting, um, I encourage those of you who are in a small setting um, to flip the script and instead of thinking about what you don't have, understand that you have an opportunity to, to um, leverage authenticity as in fact something really special that small communities have to offer. So, you know, we have this tiny little group of people and what we have is, um, you know, a monthly, a monthly newsletter and a weekly email from me. Um, all of our photos are us because that's what we've got. And, um, you know, our, um, our brand, and I didn't come up with this, Fran, our pianist did, um, is um, homemade with lots of enthusiasm. And that really works. That really works for us. Um, so that's that's. I can get into nuts and bolts, Alan, if that's where you'd like me to go, or if we want to veer back 
um, to Andy and hear a little bit more from her. But our basic context is um, a situation um, where there's there are no paid professionals, um, including me. It takes all of us to make church. Um, and communication is what we do every day as a part of our way of being together. Um, consistency, simplicity, and the personal touch. That is that is central um, to our life together. And that is a communication strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that authenticity and 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 focus on building community, you know, echoes what what Merrick and Bobby were speaking to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'll I will ask one follow-up question to you and then and then turn to to Andy. Yeah. You know, just from experience hearing from communicators around the church, you know, and those who uh, are one-stop shops for having to really be responsible for everything in the life of a parish, where can you find the time? How do you find uh, what are some ways that you can make communications more efficient um, and or how do you build sort of partners in that work? You know, there are other ways to serve in a parish um, that can be constructive. Why can't people serve in a way that supports communication? I wonder if you can speak to any examples you have for that. Yeah, a couple of examples. So first of all, in terms of my own role in this process, communications is part of my weekly discipline as the, as a preacher and a person who does is responsible for the spiritual formation of this community. So once a week, I send out a good old fashioned at this point email. Um, and it has what I've been thinking about as a preacher, um, what they can expect this Sunday, and then a personal touch, some about va- some value added. So something I've been reading, watching, listening to, um, or viewing that, um, because sometimes it's art and sometimes it's a it's a video that is inspiring me right now. So I always share something that I've been thinking about as the person who's been meditating on the scriptures that we're going to think about together that week. Um, that is, I do that. And then I have a little blurb in our monthly newsletter, which is the offering. Um, when we do our stewardship um, campaign every year, we talk about the we we actually get really specific about the gifts that people are going to bring to our community, and people make a pledge of the gifts that they would like to bring, the talents that they would like to bring to the community. And one person offered her skills as um, a person who does a newsletter for her company. Um, And so she puts together a newsletter every month. I'm just responsible for the blog. She puts together a little calendar and some resources. And then we have another person in our community um, who, you know, frankly said to me, I don't have a lot to um, offer in terms of a financial pledge. It's a younger person in an underserved community, but I have um, uh, coding skills and they built our website, um, which is, you know, a good little website and we keep it up together. So, um, There are three people at this point who are pretty intimately involved um, in our communications. Um, And it it really is that simple, um, but it does work for us. Wonderful, thank you for those couple of uh, those examples there. Um, Andy, let's try uh, try again with your audio. Thanks for uh, hopping off and back on. Um, But no, we weren't directing you speaking to, you know, the importance of uh, communicating to the community around around All Saints in the context of Atlanta. So I'll turn it back to you to hopefully pick up your thoughts. Yeah, I'm hopeful things are a little bit smoother this go round. Any luck, Alan? Sounds better, yes. Okay, fantastic, good to hear. Yeah, so that's really where I was leaving off, saying how important it is to kind of message as many different sectors kind of of your congregation as possible. And I think in this first year in this role, the main thing I've learned is that everyone's looking in different places. And some of that may be generational, some of it may be, you know, just what folks are used to, but making sure that you're really conveying that kind of singular All Saints special brand. And as Bobby was talking about, that sense of a touch at each of those touch points is really useful. So um, I was just like nodding aggressively (laughs) as uh, Bobby was talking because so many of those are things that I think all communicators are concerned with. But in church, I think it's especially important because we also like see these folks on a weekly basis, right? So it's multiple ways of communicating with folks, including in person. But everything from like twice weekly newsletters for us, we do live streams. Um, Sometimes we have live video production or video 
videos that go out on social media. Um, also that kind of branding piece, I think is really important that Bobby was also speaking to, making sure that folks can kind of see, not only from the logo, but just from the feel, the sound of the language as they're reading it in their minds, that this is coming from a particular place that's familiar also um, as a real priority for us. Um, we have like campaigns. I think Bobby was also speaking to that earlier. Um, you know, our annual canvas that we have, our parish is right now in the midst of launching a new habitat build and discerning what to do with some of our physical and other infrastructure um, going forward with a project we call Future of Our Block. All of these are things that I really need to be in constant contact with all of our staff members who need any communicative work to be done, which is all of them, but especially our rector, um, uh, Simon Mannering, um, he and I, when I first got onto this position, I was just very clear that I wanted to make sure that he and I were on the same page in terms of our priorities for a given week because we have so much programming going on, um, making sure that the things we really want to emphasize and really set apart, for instance, in our featured events box um, in our newsletter, that we're really emphasizing these are the things, the all parish, all ages events that we really really want to push everyone to um, and make sure our touch points, again, for us to really engage with our parish. Those have been things that have been very helpful for us. Um, I also was really just giggling about that calendar on the wall because I have one too, and all the different corners and bits are full. And I think for someone who didn't come from church work, that's something that was really helpful to me as well, like really adhering to that lectionary calendar and making sure that I understand what time of the year we're in, what are the kind of narratives, feelings, stories that we're trying to bring up, and then things that are also a bit more local to our parish. Being in Atlanta, we just um, marked Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday. That has an especial resonance, resonance for our parish and our immediate community. So what are the ways that we can really push the special things that we're doing around that celebration? Um, and just building on our wins and learning what are the things that we can do to tweak. Sometimes it's in the details to to make it more and more excellent going forward um, are really, really helpful kind of like tips and ways that I've been things and aspects that I've been building kind of into my workflow over the course of every week, but especially during these like festival moments that we have in our calendar. Um, the photos, I've been very, very assertive about making sure everyone knows, like I wear a name tag, people know if I'm around, photos are being taken. <laughs> and so um, trying to also like change that as part of our culture that, you know, we're not only doing the things, we're also now documenting them so that way we always come in. I think those things that really flagged um, uh, during the previous presentation that seemed really um, useful to me and have also been, been helpful um, in my context. Great, thank you for Can that, Andy. Yeah, please, One thing buddy. about photos that I didn't mention. Um, we have a poster up at all of our events that is a legal legalese. And it, it says that if you are attending this event, you will be photographed. You're okay with being photographed and we can use it in social media. I mean, we, we have to do that, it, especially with kids. When kids go into a pageant or anything like that, we do get the parents to sign uh, approval. So it's really important that we're very mindful, very respectful of all of that. And there are some parents who will say, nope, not okay with me. And and we're we're okay with that. So uh, it's really important to pay attention to that. But uh, one other thing about photos too, is that uh, Mr. Google knows what stock photos are, and they know what authentic photos are. And in SEO searches, and in any digital uh, communications, they will ding you for having stock photos. They will promote authentic videos, mostly authentic photos. So it's really important. It's another reason to use them. Yep. And so, uh, you know, Bobby, I want to uh, take a moment to, I'm no I'm moderator, but I'm going to chime in a bit, maybe as a type of panelist here, you use some terminology that may not be familiar to everyone on the call. Um, perhaps you are not the communications person in your parish or context, or maybe you're uh, you know, the one-stop shop, I've got to do communications, but how do I do it? So what did Bobby just say? Uh, you know, that type of um, 
understanding, I think, just represents what it means to bring in professional communications. And it doesn't have to be a full-time staff person. There are other ways to do it. That's what, uh, that is part of the mission of Episcopal Communicators, is to help provide resources and a means of, of um, connecting people that are doing this work in the church to troubleshoot, to learn from each other, to uh, understand that things like planning a calendar far enough out in advance will have a positive impact or paying attention to what are the technical pieces on social media that may um, boost a post forward or restrict its reach. Um, so trying to translate that a little bit for you, Bobby, I think that's spot on. Um, that's Sorry a great technical that. example. No, 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 it's, it's perfect. Uh, but when one connect other it tool, to... one other tool that small churches can use too, is you can freelance this stuff out for very little money on Fiverr or on Upwork. Those are both, I only use people who are American who are in the United States. But those two resources, for instance, we're doing a book on our the greatest hit sermon of Christ Church over the history. I have a transcriber that I use who transcribes videos of sermons. She charges me $10. So you can post jobs on there and you can say, look, here's what I need. I'll pay you whatever, $35. And people will grab it. They they do it on the side, aside from their job. So I highly recommend using a social media person on Fiverr or something like that. Great. Um, one quick uh, comment as well, a plug for um, some of my colleagues in the formation department that oversee the Safe Church uh, training and materials. Um, there are resources if you go to the EpiscopalChurch.org website and look for the Safe Church um, materials that will ex ha have some explanations on how to handle uh, photo releases, uh, in particular within the context of minors. Um, there's some guidance there, you know, overall that we need to be following, but in the context of communications, that is a, a significant sticking point. Um, so just adding that in addition to what's been shared already. Um, Andy, I have another question for you, knowing the, and it, it, it's, I'm embellishing a bit in what I've seen, come through the chat, uh, but knowing the context of, of All Saints in Atlanta and uh, I perhaps follow it, even though I don't live there, just because I've always loved y'all's communication. Um, the piece around using land, um, using the physical site um, and what that's meant for your the neighborhood where All Saints is, what that's meant for racial justice in the history of Atlanta. You know, there's a lot of weight there, but I'm wondering if you could speak perhaps just to the communications element. Uh, what is it like to be involved in such processes um, as a communications professional? What is it like then talking about it? How do you communicate about the the local activity? And then maybe what impact has that had um, within within Atlanta? I think we're in the midst of discerning a lot of what that's going to look like going forward and trying to be responsible and ethical in terms of our engagement with multiple stakeholders in our community. Um, so we're actually just at like the beginning stages of the relaunch of this process. So um, I don't want to be remiss in speaking out of turn. But one thing I do know is that there are numerous folks involved in those kinds of questions. Um, and I'm certainly engaged in the process of providing feedback from my particular context. And I think the fortunate part is there's a sense of um, a certain uh, amount of uh, necessary kind of transparency and a degree of honesty around, you know, the very fraught questions around uh, questions of race and ethnicity, um, sexuality, gender, identity, all sorts of other pieces that like flag in our work. Um, something that I've been trying to um, work on in between all of these other pieces that we're constantly having to do on a routine basis is questions around more inclusive language um, throughout our communications, but including in areas that I don't necessarily directly oversee like liturgy and music. And so um, it just goes to show you that like communications kind of touches all of these different pieces um, and needs to be more and more involved at earlier and earlier stages. So that's something that I've been trying to build into our culture with some success. Um, but I think it's an ongoing kind of practice and it does like go down to the very like land that our uh, church sits on. Um, but so many other questions, those the same issues flag and as a Parish that sits in a very, very diverse area. Um, Atlanta is an incredibly diverse city um, and is in the process of continuing the work of trying to uh, be welcoming to all sorts of folks. And I think that's kind of um, All Saints kind of calling for welcome to all sorts, all folks, um, no matter what your particular um, background is. 
And so knowing that and trying to build that into, you know, our various communications going outward, we're remiss if we don't take the time to actually make sure that that is integral to the work that we practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, yeah, a little bit of a, of a, of a, a work, run around in terms of that response, but um, I'll for sure keep you posted on how we continue to evolve that practice. Thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you going there with me uh, with that question. So um, thank you for that. Um, a question for, for all of you, and, and Nandra, I may pitch this to you first. Uh, someone asked about, you know, we've been talking a lot about technology. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly, Bobby, I think the shift to, to a lot going to the phone makes sense. And Absolutely. there are also contexts where, you know, less technologically advanced, you know, forms of communication may be best, um, whether that's for age and, you know, th the materials or devices people use, or it can even be geographic reach. I mean, there we have dioceses where making phone calls on, you know, non-smartphones is, is a primary means of communication. Um, so Nandra, I'm wondering if how that's come up in your context, and, and then would love for Bobby and Andy and, and Merrick to chime in as well. Sure. I think, I think our question is the same question, actually, that faces any size church, which is what is the, the, the just right amount of technology, which isn't always the most technology. It's the just right amount for your community. So in our case, what that means is um, we're actually, we do ha we have one of the best Zoom protocols I think I've, I've ever seen because we're small, we can really worship with Zoom. So uh, uh, um, we, have, we have people who are actually members of our community, real members um, who participate by Zoom because we carry, we carry a laptop around and people can read and talk to each other. Um, and we're very accustomed to meeting by Zoom and having Bible studies together by Zoom. So Zoom is a technology that's really worked for us. Even our oldest members are eager to use it because it's a way it, it's it um it is a it is of a piece with our identity as a group of people people who really value interaction with each other live. Um, we haven't had as much success with um, lots of online platforms for organizing ourselves. Um, good old fashioned phone trees work best for us because people like to be personally invited. Um, similarly, I mean, just using our own personal, you know, social media pages and the local paper, um, we get more traction with those than we do um, with more sophisticated ways of getting the word out about what we do, because that's just what's valued um, in our space. So there's been a learning curve about what works and what is needed um, and what, what takes up too much bandwidth for us. And sometimes the answers are surprising. It's not low tech versus high tech. For us, it's high context versus low context. I appreciate that. And, and a good reminder too that, you know, another angle for thinking about investing in communication is making sure the community is, you know, has what they need um, yeah. to access, you know, and then that might mean teaching folks within the congregation, you know, how to use a particular tool. Um, I think right. I saw someone from the the Society of the Companions of the Holy Cross on here. Um, Y'all were one of my favorite groups to do a civil discourse training with and just the, you know, sharpest, most precise group uh, and using Zoom. It was wonderful and effortless. And I know that, that in y'all's context, that took effort, um, right, to really learn how to use Zoom. And frankly, you're doing it, you were doing it better than most, uh, at least for that program. So um, Bobby and Andy, I don't know if you have anything else to add, and then um, we'll wrap up with some closing remarks on the yeah, technology Andy, question. Something you want to add to that? Um, sure. I can. Uh, but go about um, As far as uh, it, it we mold it to what talent we have here. So for instance, Kate Moorhead does uh, every morning, she does a, uh, on the phone, she does a talk, a video and it's prayerful and she walks around her house. She'll talk about a painting in her house. She does, Kate does that. She loves doing that. Here, we don't have someone who's comfortable doing that. So, so you have to adapt to what they really want to do. What is the passion? Merrick is an incredible writer. Uh, I have a contract with a local newspaper, an annual contract. And so we place ads and they give us editorial space. And Merrick writes a column for them. And so whenever we have a press release that comes out or whatever they, so you have to go with what you have. So for Instagram, I deal with the younger mommies and with uh, other things, newspapers are for older people. So I gear, so each thing is a different plan of attack, if you will. 
Andy, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah. yeah, I think that's totally right, Bobby. Exactly. I mean, the Instagram is not going to be the same audience that's actually looking at your digital signage in church on the third level of that building, right? Isn't going to be the same audience that's going to be looking at the ad that you took out in a local paper or what have you. So knowing that you're getting a segment of your audience, your desired audience with each thing means that you actually have to do each thing, but also with some frequency because it's not as those folks are constantly looking at what we're doing, right? They've got eyeballs everywhere um, or constantly in demand. So folks are looking a lot of different places. So making sure that, it, you know, it's a, exciting and desirable and projects the work that you're doing in the best light are all important things. Um, but I would also say just, I, I guess, building on some of Nandra's points around this question of the importance of kind of just the right amount of technology. I think that's especially the case um, if, as all of us should be doing, we're building in opportunities for parishioners to support our work. Um, I think that's especially when it's useful to find tools that are kind of modular, you know, for folks who are interested and really care to go deep, there's more that they can learn. But for folks who just want to be able to do the minimum thing, they can kind of plug and play. Um, I think one example for us is um, I was able to, um, with some parishioner support, kind of build out what we call the photography guild. So it's support from our parishioners to help do photography for all of the events that we have throughout the course of a week. And um, the useful part about this is that, you know, I don't have to be absolutely everywhere because that's challenging when you have so many responsibilities on you. It can be difficult to be in two places at once. So knowing that that's the case, it's great. But then, like, how are they going to routinely send me the images? Well, you have to kind of build in that system. Fortunately, we have a tool called Smug Mug. It has an app. You can download it. There's a link. People can upload their photos. I can review them. You know, we have kind of a certain clip that we're developing. But all of that kind of requires a bit of research, um, a bit of tutorial, you know, you got to set aside that time. So it's one of those things that actually there's quite a bit of investment in terms of time and perhaps some resource on the front end, but it just pays dividends. Mm -hmm. Agree. Wonderful. Well, we are coming up on time. Um, so Bobby, Merrick, Andy, Nandra, thank you all so much for your insight, thank your you. wisdom today. Um, and thank you all for attending as well. Uh, you've asked some great questions. I know there are a lot we did not get to. Um, and then for many of the questions that have been asked too, they're quite technical, but important to be considering. Um, and so just one more time to plug Episcopal Communicators, um, please consider joining as a member um, and really become a part of our community where we discuss these very questions and try to troubleshoot with one another, um, figure out what is best, what's worked elsewhere. Um, as I have found it uh, to be a wonderful resource over the last you know seven years with the church and um, hope that you will as well. Um, and thank you to the Episcopal Parish Network as well, Joe and the team there uh, for allowing us to do this program and for the partnership um, sort of looking at, you know, as, as Episcopal Parish Network looks at forming uh, the different roles, forming and supporting the different roles within our congregation to take seriously the role of communications, uh, whether that's someone in, in the role as an individual or it's just a, a small piece of your job. Um, so again, thank you all and I look forward to seeing you all in the next program.